Welcome back to the Marvel Movie Minute, a daily podcast in which we assemble to explore the films of the Marvel Cinematic Universe one minute at a time. In this, our sixth season, we're looking at The Avengers. I'm Andy Nelson from the True Story FM Entertainment Podcast Network. And I'm Pete Wright, and I am here to swallow it. <laughs> Today, I don't, I don't think I've ever gotten that reaction on an intro before. I feel like I just won the podcast. <laughs> you might have. That was something, for sure. <laughs> Today we are talking about Minute 19, which begins with what Bruce tries to avoid and ends with a gun in our face. Joining us on the show today is Robin Burge. Hello, Robin. Uh, yeah, uh, Andy, I think we're facing another Sparky. potential global catastrophe in which uh, the entire world is taken out by one of Pete's jokes. Just the entire <laughs> the potential energy to wipe out the oh, entire God. planet. <laughs> And, and and we generally try to avoid that. Now Robin won the podcast. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> yeah, starting like that. Can he be trusted? Here we are. Welcome. <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. Good question. I'll be asking myself that all season. <laughs> are we going to get another one of those that could destroy us all? <laughs> No, but thank you very much for having me on. I love the Avengers. I love Marvel. I'm here again. We're here for it. Absolutely. Now, I am curious because, you know, we're doing this season a little differently. You're on just one minute this particular week, and then we're not going to have you back for a little while. So I wanted to find out what is the particular reason that you wanted to discuss this minute? Oh, God, this one minute uh, is is great because it I love how uh, it really brings uh, Bruce in and makes him scary. In, 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 you're, he's like uh, he's like the wolf man or something. He's going to be set off any time now. And there's just this one moment that happens we'll discuss, which really is like like makes you jump in your seat if you're if you know you ha- you're not ready for it. Uh, and uh, it makes uh, it makes uh, Natasha jump in her seat as well. <laughs> so I was surprised nobody had taken it yet. So I was like, oh god, I got to grab that one. I am too, especially because that moment and immediately after that moment also for me makes uh Mark Ruffalo oh, Bruce god. Banner and not I don't think about Edward Norton right. again. Like I'm I'm kind of finished with Edward Norton even though we've kind of had a little bit of him for the last couple of minutes. This is this is the minute that that solidifies I'm I'm in good hands with Ruffalo. Where, I mean, where do you stand with Ruffalo as uh, Bruce Banner, Robin? It's 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 a different take. I mean, we are used to kind of, you know, in the comics and the cartoons and, and even, you know, Norton, it's uh, kind of a, like a nerdy approach. Bill Bixby was more of like the kind of like the everyman, but none of them like scared me. I love the physicality that Ruffalo brings. I love he's just a little bit more hairier too, which again brings that kind of wolfman energy. <laughs> I especially love. I, I I always whenever I think of Mark Ruffalo playing Bruce Banner, it's that the way he's holding his knuckles. Mm. It, it's just something about that that seems like there's something going on. He's trying to control a little beast inside, you know. I do you feel that over the course of the franchise they've uh treated the character the same or do you feel like you know they've gone too far down kind of the goofy comedic road with him i for sure think that we've he's he's just you can't take him as seriously as you do in this movie for sure i would love to have a solo hulk movie with ruffalo as the hulk just to get us back to maybe a little bit of this or you know a a mixture of what we see in the Avengers movies and, and uh, well, I guess in this Avengers movie, but, but, you know, the later, you know, the professor Hulk and the, the, you know, the comedy that uh, he's a part of in Ragnarok. And of course uh, what happens in she Hulk by the end, I'm just, I'm just like, what happened? What's going on here? <laughs> so, uh, but I love it. I love, I love to see, I'd love to see another uh, movie, uh, just a straight up Hulk. movie. I don't know if we'd ever get, like a straight up Hulk movie, if it's not going to be like something cosmic involved or something more worldly, you know, I love the idea of Bruce on the run. I mean, that's how I watched uh, the Incredible Hulk, Incredible Hulk as a kid. Yeah, <laughs> just it yeah, goes right, down sure. to town and gets a, gets into a scrap and has to get out of it, and the Hulk comes out and saves the day, and we move on. Credits. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if we'll ever get anything like that again. Well, then there's definitely a little more of that animalistic side. And even though Bixby was pretty, I, I don't know, I think that he feels very much kind of like what we get from Ruffalo or even Norton. Like they all kind of like the, the Bruce Banner side of it 
feels pretty, you know, better. But I, I, I really do like, and w- what you're saying is like this minute really exemplifies the sense of danger that we get from Hulk. And even in, you know, from earlier, uh, when Natasha finds out that she's the one who has to go talk to the big guy and she realizes who's they're talking about, she's like, Oh, oh God, uh, you know, in Russian. And, you know, she has a sense of what this character is capable of. And I like that in this particular moment, we're getting some of that. We're getting this sense that she's having a, a normal conversation with him, but she's also ready and she's wary. You know, she's paying attention. And what do you think of, uh, of Black Widow? Do you like, do you like, uh, the way that Scarlett Johansson plays this character? Oh God. I mean, I think Black Widow is, is great in this movie. You know, we've got like, you know, touches of her in Iron Man too, but I really, you know, the, the whole introduction to her in the chair uh, at the beginning, you know, I, I don't want to give Joss Whedon too many kudos, but I think he really, <laughs> you know, uh, but uh, I, I think he really yeah. kind of brought that kind of almost like a, a Buffy energy. Like he's really good at the, the female, you know, kick-ass protagonist. And uh, I think he invested some time into making Black Widow, not just this, like, you know, side character in Iron Man 2, but, um, you know, smart, capable, and strong, uh, and fearless uh, character here. I, I, I dig her a lot. <laughs> and of course, and it's, and it's great to compare. We have the scene with her in the chair, and she seems to be just you know, and she just she has that entire room under control. But here, it's cool that we get a little dimension of like, oh no, no, she's she's actually trying to control how scared she is of what, <laughs> what might happen here. Yeah, that when she jumps back, she kind of you can tell her facade breaks, mm-hmm. and and I think that's an important note for her to to show us a little bit of that vulnerability, even in a character that is so dominating and in control. Mm-hmm. Well, that's what's so interesting about the scene. And, and some of it ends up in tomorrow's minute that we'll talk about with another guest. But the idea of her playing this role, you know, here she is, she's acting completely, um, you know, normal, everything's okay, but she's ready. And and when we have that jump moment from Bruce, which I'll admit, I, I generally kind of, I, I don't watch this so often. So when I watch it again, I jump again, because it just comes out of nowhere. And it's incredibly effective, you know, the voice modulation, they give a little hint to his voice and everything, and and it just works really well. And then the way that she reacts, like she is back into work mode, she pulls that gun out that, of course, she's hidden under the table, and she holds it at him. And then she also in her face, and you're, you're just kind of talking about this, Pete, how, you know, she kind of, there's that little break in her performance here. And, you, you know, her eyes have that look where there's a little hint of fear that she's trying to kind of hover, cover up. Uh, almost like watery. It's, I don't want to call it teary, but kind of like this watery, like defensive. She's ready and she's ready to attack. But then, as we'll see in the next minute, like that shifts again as she has everybody stand down. So it's just, it's really interesting the way that she portrays herself through this whole scene. And, you know, I, I you know, <laughs> we're recording all these out of order and we're recording these uh, you know, in in such a strange fashion this this season. I'm not sure if we've talked about it or not, but her outfit, like this is the same day that she was in Russia and here she is now. And she's wearing this like beautiful dress. And so she's totally changed into something that feels more appropriate p- perhaps for this conversation to take place as opposed to um, the dress that she was wearing when she was uh, captured in, in Russia. So well, that that dress would look weird in this little, what, village, like right. charming little poor mountain town. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it would look weird to be in her little black dress. Like uh, she does, she absolutely fits the style of a matron of this village, sure. this poor village. Outside and, of Calcutta, right. Um, yeah. And so, I mean, I totally believe uh, that you know, her, she's maintaining the the effort and the the what she's taught as a spy. Like she's trying to blend in. Weird. I mean, let's well, honestly, she doesn't really blend in, <laughs> right? But, but she's you know, in the in the, the auspices of the film, she blends right. in. Heavy yeah, quotes, yeah. Sure. She's. I, I mean, she's dressed for the weather. Uh, I I can't re- remember exactly wh- how she gets into the you know the where she's tied up situation but it almost seems like she was kidnapped from a party on purpose or something like she was at some sort of like formal yeah. party and uh right uh you know that's why she's dressed the way she is there 
But exactly. Yeah. We're all just waiting for the black lead to shoot and the, the, the gauntlets to come out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Something a little more appropriate for her fighting. Right. So, all right. So now we're getting into kind of this whole thing with the Tesseract. She pulls out her phone and shows Bruce this picture of the Tesseract. And conveniently, (laughs) I love how everything, for some reason, has to somehow involve gamma radiation because the Tesseract conveniently emits gamma radiation. And so that's why, I, I guess that's why in context of the story, they've decided, well, we want Hulk here. So we need to bring Bruce in because this thing has gamma. I mean, would it have made sense to just bring Bruce in because he's a smart scientist anyway and he can help and maybe the Hulk might come in handy? Or does it does this angle of approaching Bruce to to say, hey, you know a lot about Gamma more than most. uh, Can we have you come help us help with this? I mean, it seems like such a coincidence that like, well, we're going to need Hulk there. But Bruce as a character is going to (laughs) need to be uh, appealed, you know, by his by his brain like let, let's give him a puzzle let's let let's make it so he's you know not being he doesn't feel like he's getting manipulated into getting experimented on by you know general ross yeah. or whatever but but so it just so happens that the tesseract can be found by some sort of faint gamma radiation but i, I i'd also love to hear from the gamma radiation experts in this world who are just kind of irritated at being passed over time after time in favor of the guy <laughs> <who> <laughs> Oh, you're telling me the guy that turned himself into a green monster with great gamma radiation is smarter than me. Okay. Right. <laughs> Who's an expert in gamma with two thumbs and not a mad green <laughs> right. monster? This guy, yeah. right? Like, like I kind of want that conversation where she goes and says, Bruce, this whole thing is, is emitting theta radiation. What are we going to do? And Bruce is like, yeah. hey, I'm out. I'm only the gamma guy. What are you going to do next? <laughs> Go to Tony Stark about time travel? Yeah. I mean, yeah. come on. I'm not the guy. <laughs> Right, exactly. Come on. It feels, this part feels a little bit like video game to me, right? Like, I, we just got a new uh, platform and I'm playing Spider Man. The the new greatest Spider Man came out a couple years ago. Absolutely loving it. Getting ready for Spider Man 2. And there are all these missions, right, that are about specific things that happen to be right in the the bailiwick of our principal character and that's what this feels like to me you have to go around the world and like repair a bunch of antennas that are like emitting gamma radiation and they literally do that later in the movie <laughs> like that's the whole plan once he's on the helicarrier and and so i that's the part that it, it feels a little bit as grounded as so much of the universe feels this stuff sometimes doesn't feel all that grounded it feels super super mechanical and and less interesting shoehorn it, well and that you know it's i i suppose as a writer it would present a an exciting opportunity to think about okay this is a puzzle how do i get bruce involved in a story not as the hulk although we want him to be the hulk at some point and still be kind of considered part of this team but what could be the draw for this? And I can't help but feel that there has to be an angle other than just the gamma. It just it feels like because that's what people know him for, it kind yeah. of just becomes shorthand to just throw in there just as an excuse. And, you know, it, I don't know, Andy, I feel like you said it like I feel like the shorthand was already established in science. Yeah. Like The guy has been established as straight up brilliant. Why do we have to make it gamma? Like there's there's nothing that about the Tesseract that screams a particular kind of radiation. It's a blue goo. We've established it's blue goo. It's not even green. <laughs> yeah, right. It's not even green. <laughs> oh my God, well played. Yes. Yeah. I think science. He's smart. He's a scientist. Just make it science. We don't have to Yeah. Yeah. It it feels like a game. I uh, yeah. I, I think that there could have been something set up in that first conversation instead of Selvig saying it's emitting gamma and we've got, I mean, it is a funny line from Fury when he's like, well, that can be dangerous. Like, I like the way that yeah. that plays, but there could have been something else that was very sciencey that could have been the excuse that they brought him in. And yeah, I, I, and then we wouldn't have had to dis- have this thing in here that just ends up feeling shoehorned, as you said. But it's here. Yeah, it's just to get him on there. <laughs> yeah. I, I just think that Nick Fury might be a little concerned about bringing the Hulk onto his helicarrier. <laughs> it just, just doesn't seem like the smart, at least do it on the ground. As you said, especially in this film, because this of all of them is the film where Hulk actually feels dangerous. Like you feel like yeah. this is a person that you're 
you should feel worried about having around. Yeah. And this scene actually sets that up really well, right? Like you're out in the middle of nowhere. We're away from people. So you, you've created this environment where if I do Hulk out, I'm not going to go destroying the town. And so I, I like the way that all of this sets up this this character that is very dangerous. And And yeah, it just, it does make you really stretch your mind to the reasons that they would gravitate to having him. Why doesn't S.H.I.E.L.D. have a Zoom? <laughs> <laughs> we need to do remote. This is remote science. We need to do remote science this time. I, I feel like that's, we're gonna, we need to bookmark this because we're going to have more conversations about the structure of the helicarrier, in particular, vis-a-vis the Hulk uh, later minutes yeah. in this show. And yes. I have thoughts. Um, <laughs> this, that's, a, that's a whole different ballgame. Yeah. Now, something else that I was wondering. So when she slides her phone over to him with the little picture of the Tesseract on it, it lands and the shot ends up next to what looks like some form of it, it's a, a it's like an Indian book. It's got Hindi written on it. It looks I don't know if it's a comic book or a pamphlet, but it's got like a little cartoon face on it. And it just made me ask myself again, where are they? Is this like a S.H.I.E.L.D. safe house that they happen to have nearby? Is this just some random place that they just staged? I mean, it's it's decked out. It, I mean, it, it's not decked out. It's not like it's fancy or anything, but it's it's decked out like somebody is living here. Do either of you like think about the context of what this place is where we are? I got I from my recollection, uh, Bruce went there to help treat uh, a sick kid. And it turned out that kid got paid off to bring Bruce there. And that, so I assume that's like a, some sort of family home that, you know, Natasha's like, here's some money. <laughs> <laughs> go to town. And, uh, yeah. Do you think like, cause the little girl that he followed here, do you think it's actually like her family's place? And, and Natasha set this up to like, Hey, I'm going to have you do this for me. And then I'm going to, I'm going to basically pay. Here's, I don't know, a, a bunch of money that we're going to give you to rent your place for a bit, essentially. You know, I, I didn't think, I, I think I didn't think any of that. I, I really just assumed it was it was just like she paid off the little girl. She probably paid off some other family and said, hey, this is an empty house now and I need everybody to clear out so that I can use it to have this conversation. Like it just it, it doesn't feel like any sort of shield organization. It feels like somebody's home. So, OK, so here's a question. If somebody came to you and said, hey, I'm with a secret government organization, we would like to use your house to stage a meeting. And of course, they're not telling you all this, but essentially for purposes of this experiment, where's the line for you as far as say, saying, OK, you got to clear out your house may be destroyed because the person we're bringing, you know, it's a little bit of a yeah, can be a little bad right. sometimes. I, let's, <laughs> yeah, let's assume that secret spy organization isn't saying that I think secret spy organization is saying, hey, here are some dollar signs. How far will these dollar signs get you at the market? We'll see you in about three or four hours right, and see yeah. what happens. You know what I mean? Sure, like, sure, I sure. just, I, I feel like this is just a straight up payoff. The bigger question for me is actually in that opening sequence, I didn't see any of the shield agents with their cell phones out taking pictures of the Tesseract <laughs> before it was stolen. How does she have such a clean cell phone picture of it right <laughs> Well, here? they've had it for a while. I <laughs> Nobody asked that. It was Hawkeye taking pictures from the gantry? <laughs> I didn't that's see that. That's all he does. Yes. Yeah, that's true. He's up on the gantry. He's got right. He's got he's a whole a series of hobbyists. Yeah, he's got all sorts of telephoto lenses, and he's like, "Let's see how close yeah. I can get to that thing." Yeah, yeah. you're like, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Kevin Feige, okay. can you send me the dailies from <laughs> earlier in the movie? <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's funny. Does Marvel or Kevin Feige see the Tesseract as the space stone at this point? I don't want to spoil. If- future movies but no like, i mean yeah how far in advance do you think this was planned like it seems like they're gonna get more cosmic you know when aliens land later on in this movie but yeah right i i feel like i mean i don't know i haven't i haven't uh i've uh, you know i have not heard back from kevin <laughs> <laughs> i'm still waiting Still waiting. God, we keep trying. Uh, <laughs> have you tried K E V I N? Have you tried that? Yet? <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> Kevin at Marvel.com. Yeah, yeah, That's it, right? Yeah. Has hat. <laughs> right. Um, I have been um, I, 
going with the assumption that by this point, you know, they've they're introducing Thanos at the end of the movie. Uh, um, oh, and yeah, they true. probably already have a sense of, OK, we're going to need these things because I'm, I'm guessing that they kind of had a sense they wanted to do the Infinity uh, Saga. And kind of go through that. So I'm guessing that they realized, okay, well, we have the Tesseract, we have this scepter. Um, let's just let's start creating these other things. We can use these two, and then we'll come up some, with some other things, and we can turn them into Infinity Stones in some capacity. And I think that's. I don't think that they necessarily thought of that. Um, it does. Well, I should say, from my perspective, it doesn't seem like they were thinking of that when they um, first brought it up in Thor. But yeah. considering that Thor, Captain America, and this all kind of seem to have been lumped into one little production schedule as far as, like, getting the phase one done, maybe they did. You know, maybe they did kind of have this idea. Man, um, I forgot Thanos is in this movie. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, to that end, it that still bothers me, though, that the scepter is also blue. I feel like, well, yeah, maybe should that be yellow, perhaps, you know? But, yeah. Um. Mm. Yeah, I don't know. I haven't found anything definitive as far as um, where they were in the thinking with that. The other question I wrote down for for you guys was, what would happen if the Hulk actually did swallow the Tesseract? Would it turn him into Captain Marvel? <laughs> Ooh. That would be an interesting version of Captain Marvel. A very Amazing angry. retcon. Yeah. <laughs> we need that one. A very if. angry yeah. Captain Marvel. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. What does he want me to do? Swallow it? That's the first line of the what yeah. if, and, and then he, he swallows, swallows it. it, and then he's Captain <laughs> Marvel. Yes, he does want you to swallow it. <laughs> he does want you to swallow it. He said, please have him, please have the big guy swallow this thing for me right now. And he swallows it. I cannot wait for that. What if season two? I'm here totally here for it. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Okay, so here's another question for you. Do, is this a situation, because she doesn't give Bruce a lot of details as far as what uh, Fury is looking for. Like, where's the line with Bruce? Like, if she started talking about, you know, there's this alien guy who came down and stole this thing, and we need you to help us. Or do you feel like what she actually says, uh, you know, it's been taken, it has a gamma signature, uh, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, that's really all he told me. Do you feel like that's enough? Or do you think that, um, like, where where's your sense of Bruce? Like, is he one of these people that it would be better to just give him all the information or play it safe like she is? Yeah, I mean, what does anybody, uh, how, how does anybody react when someone just like ser says with a serious face, like aliens exist, uh, <laughs> and, yeah. uh, and we're going to need you to help <laughs> us fight the aliens, you know? I mean, uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure. Well, I have a feeling if you, if you turn into a green monster, I have a feeling you yeah. probably are, have an easier time buying into things when people tell you like <laughs> the, that. The answer to that question is, of course, there are aliens. <laughs> Hold my beer, right? Like, there is just only so far your your credulity will be stretched. Like, you That's get true. it. Uh -huh. I mean, the, here, <laughs> I, I feel like the bigger issue is that he's a scientist, right? Is that, you know, his entire ideology is about, like, give me all the data and let me start churning through it. And so she is hedging a little bit too much for for my taste but not beyond believability like i i also feel like to that extent bruce he's been on the run for a long time and my memory of like uh, of hulk of the incredible hulk of all the hulks like his entire mission is to be on the run to protect people but also to fix himself so he can be back with people like his his entire mission is to solve this problem so that he can reintegrate. It's not that he's not a team player. So if he's presented with an opportunity like he is here to both do science and potentially be a team player, it feels totally believable the way Ruffalo plays it to say, like, you know, I'm a risk. And also, I kind of I'm, I'm a moth to the flame here. This is pretty exciting. But there is a bit of that a bit of that not he doesn't really trust anybody at this point. Uh, so, that, yeah, you got to do your best to appeal to him. So, I'll pro yeah, I probably wouldn't bring the aliens into it for sure. And be like, we have this tech <laughs> and, uh, you know, gamma stuff and you're going to be. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Right, right, right. What do the two of you think of the choice of the director to shift the approach of filming in this scene? And when he freaks out, generally the shots have been, you know, we've been kind of three quarter front facing or side shots. And suddenly when when Bruce uh, screams at her, 
we go to basically his POV uh, as she pulls the gun and points the gun directly in our face, the camera's face. And the, and there's also a, a depth of field change where suddenly now we go, we rack focus from her to the tip of the gun. Uh, does that, how does that play for you, for you both? I mean, it's, it's definitely a shift in production style here. Yeah, it's surprising. It, it makes it a little bit more intense. I, I mean, I, I like it. <laughs> well, I think we've already talked about like when, like all of us have that reaction when he yells and she pulls the gun, we jump. Like, that's what it's designed to do. I think it's meant to be jarring. I think it's meant to shock us visually. I think that, you know, staring down the barrel of a gun is, no matter what the context, is a threatening thing. And I think we're meant to feel the threat between the two of them that exists, the lack of trust, the threat, the increasing intensity. It, it all just, I mean, it absolutely plays. I think it's a great choice. And it's a sign that the director understands the overall energetic pacing, not just of the minute, but of the scene, that this represents the 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 height of intensity in this scene. And we all need to be on that same frame. Mm. Yeah, no, I, I wasn't so sure. I, I But I do think, uh, you know, talking about it, I think that does make sense. Because I, when I watched it, I'm like, oh, that's interesting. And maybe the POV doesn't throw me so much as the as the sudden decision to do like a really narrow depth of field where we rack focus just to the tip of the gun. But to your point, I guess what it is doing there is it's giving us a sense of Black Widow as the expert that she is using the weapons that she has uh, and putting that between her and this potential massive behemoth of a threat. You know, and so now we're focused very, very specifically on just the gun. And and we have this sense, even though we know and she knows that it's not something that's going to stop Hulk if, you know, Bruce decides to Hulk out. But it is something that kind of gives us this this wall between the two of them, at least. So, well, and it's so interesting. I've been thinking a lot about foveal vision, right? This whole idea that, you know, we use our. Uh, foveal vision to scrutinize very, very high, fine, detailed objects. And this, this frame, right? This, this like cut forces us to stare right at the, at the gun, right at the gun, right? Everything else goes fuzzy. It goes peripheral. We're not supposed to, to pay any attention to it. We're supposed to be staring right at the gun. And I think that I, I I think you're right. I think that it's a jarring choice. But for me, God, it just works so well because it is amping up that that in, intensity of the, the threat of staring at the barrel of a gun like that is a that I think it's just a great choice. It's a stupidly great choice. Yeah, me. you get shocked out of like just kind of like, you know, kind of blandly watching a movie. And I was like, ah! and then it goes right from that scare like, oh, my gosh, you know, uh, the Hulk is about to happen. And then, boom, there's a gun right in your face and she could just fire. And then you, the next shot would be the Hulk with a bullet in his teeth, you know, <laughs> you know? yeah. Is right. this going to go exactly. into overdrive or what's happening here? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. There's a hot second, I think, where you don't actually like where I speaking just for myself, where I forget I'm watching a movie. Right. That's the shock. Like just a just a, a millisecond where I'm like, oh, crap, that's a gun <laughs> pointed at my face. And I think that's mm -hmm. the point. Yeah. 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 I, I, if you don't mind me uh, recalling a story, I, I'd love to tell you guys about the first time that I saw the Avengers uh, oh, yeah, I do. I, I went uh, with my wife at the time. We're separated uh, it, to the drive-ins. And we're like, oh, my God, this, I, this, it'll be the best to see the Avengers on a big drive-in screen. Only problem was we had a newborn. Uh, we had a young, oh. young baby. <laughs> and they're like, we'll get there. We'll put a blanket out. We'll relax. And, you know, she just started crying and wailing. And the movie's starting. And so every time I watch the Avengers, I'm like, yep. Oh, she was still crying during this part. <laughs> still crying, and God, we 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 brought her in the car. We had nice, warm, and safe. And that the child just wanted to go home. She just get me out of here. She, I, actually, I think she was like more of like a toddler, and it was just kind of she's taking yeah. turns, pat her on the back. Just go to sleep, honey. It's going to be okay. We're just we're just out, you know, for a little picnic, <laughs> and uh, and and so just screaming and screaming. And finally, she's just calming down. Oh God! So, and and then oh, you know, and she's just falling asleep. And then all of a sudden, just, stop lying to me. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, no! <laughs> <laughs> All over again. <laughs> 
This was the moment. So, uh, yeah, the moment. Uh, awesome. we got her. We got her back to sleep again. But it was just kind of like, oh my god, what are you doing to me, movie? <laughs> oh, so funny. Weirdly, those were also her first words. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> we're not at a me. picnic. You're trying to watch a superhero movie. I don't want to be here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what That's a story. Funny. That's awesome. <laughs> well, uh, so one more question. Right toward the end of this minute, after this moment, Bruce says to her, that was mean. I just wanted to see what you do. Is is this like some crazy test of his? Like, how do you, how do you read his decision to have done that? Because clearly, as, he's, as he says there, it wasn't it, like he did it purposefully. He, he decided he was going to do this to kind of get a rise out of her and see how the situation would play. I don't know, but but how does it read? Awesome. This is the moment that I <laughs> that, that was so fantastic for me that solidified Ruffalo for me, and in even in in sort of questionable circumstances, uh, you know, leading away from Incredible Hulk and Edward Norton, I I love this line, and I particularly love that was mean because he knows no matter what happens next, he is still the the toughest thing in the space and he is going to be fine and so he has a lot of leeway to run these little tests you know he has a hypothesis that she might have been lying to him therefore he's going to test that hypothesis by you know leveraging what he has which is incredible strength i love it right yeah it's it's as it you know i i'm sure bruce has felt like like on the run and and if, if, you're know, trying to to stay calm at all times, but you know, as we see in this movie, and you know, at the end of the movie, he's trying to figure out a way to uh, use that power that he has, and uh, and yeah, right here, it's to to intimidate and kind of, and he knows that, you know, if he does get, uh, well, then again, he doesn't want to turn into the Hulk. That's the thing. It's like, yes, but I, I don't. Uh, does he? Why would he want to make the situation more more tense? But maybe he's controlled it so far. But you know, I mean, don't you think there's a little piece of him in that smile? Just a little piece, and I'm sure this is me reading into it. But after having been on the run, having been in hiding for so long, having gone so far away to try to to you know get the, put this part of part of his life behind him and and move forward with the science and the healing. That when another force comes in and attempts to threaten him, that he's just a little bit subversively glad about it, <laughs> that there's just a little thing that says, OK, you really want to do this? I can do this. Right. I can do what you're asking me to do. And if you force me, I will do it. And I might do it with a <laughs> smile because I'm always angry. <laughs> I'm always angry. If. If she, if her job had been to go get uh, Tony, as she initially thought, and this was Coulson, uh, would you think Coulson would have reacted the same way? <laughs> <laughs> would we be here in that in that scenario? Oh, wow, <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I, uh, well, I, I, I you know I guess I guess I'm asking in a cheeky way, but to a certain extent, it does make me wonder. Like, why was she specifically the one sent here, as opposed to Coulson, who could have been sent here? Because Colson couldn't pull off that dress, <laughs> right? So you're I saying mean, you're saying that you know there I mean? needed to be someone in a dress here for this to work. Hmm. I'm saying that sending a woman, no matter who it is, sending a woman to this guy is, in Fury's and uh, Colson's opinion, less threatening, and sending this woman, who is less threatening but also can take care of herself is probably part of the strategy. Yeah, I wonder if they know much about his relationship with Betty. And remember Betty? <laughs> <laughs> Those were the oh, days. Betty. <laughs> and it's like, oh, he's probably lonely. I don't know. That would have that would have actually been really interesting yeah. had they got Betty. If they found yeah. Betty. Yeah. yeah, to bring her in just for this scene yeah. to be the person who talked him into helping. Mm. What an interesting cameo opportunity that would have been. Would we have gotten Liv Tyler for anyway. this or <laughs> <laughs> do you think Liv Tyler or Jennifer Conley? Who do you think it would have they to be? Liv Tyler. She's the one who I was. Know. Yeah. She's not the. She's the MCU Betty. Yeah. Although it would have been really confusing for people <laughs> if they got Jennifer Conley, <laughs> especially then when she shows up in uh, Spider Man's. Uh, no, in Tony's. Who's now? I'm getting confusing yeah. myself. Who is she? The voice for it's it's Spider Man, right? 
no, she's she's the little oh, Spider Man voice. She is she the voice of the of Friday? Yeah, because or whatever because she's no. with uh, Paul Bettany, and Paul Bettany is Jarvis. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, that would have really thrown people. <laughs> Chris Sworn was somebody else for Spider Man, and maybe it was Jennifer Connelly for Tony. We'll see in the we'll see in the forums. <laughs> I, 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 but she's in there. She's in there. But but yeah. But would yeah. but it would have been funny. Like people would have said, "Did they get Betty Betty Ross came in to do the voice for Tony's suit?" Hmm. <laughs> Oh my That's gosh. amazing. Oh my gosh. That would have been great. All right. Well, uh, at the end of this minute, we're kind of in the middle of, of Banner and his little trying to calm uh, Natasha down moment. Uh, I don't have anything else for this minute. Do either of you have any last things to talk about here? Oh, no, no. I, I just, I, this is a, it's just such an awesome movie. You know, no matter who ended up, who, who was behind the camera, uh, I, I, I love this movie. It's intensely rewatchable. It's definitely probably still up in my like top five Marvel. So, uh, yeah, I, I look forward to uh, seeing where you guys go with it and uh, and coming back for some uh, future episodes. <laughs> yeah, when you're back. You're not back till like minute is mixed minute 67. Is that when you're no, you're before that you're like 50. I'm looking right now trying to find your name on here. 54. I think that's your next time, right? <laughs> sure. I'm not sure what that is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know. I, I think my next one is uh, Tony having some uh, having some small talk with Colson that humored me. So I was like, I'll sign up for this one. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking right now. It's definitely it's definitely helicarrier minutes. I see. I see them all sitting around the table. That's the one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, Thor, yeah. Yeah. banter or brooding? Because those are the only two things that happen at the table. It's either banter or brooding. <laughs> it's, all, it's all chit chat, and then uh, uh, yeah, Tony and Colson walk in together. Yeah. So that's that's your minute. So that's when you're back. Yeah, it'll be a little while, but we are definitely looking forward to having you back then. Uh, so thanks for joining us today, though. We certainly appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, this is really fun. I, I love that I'm going to be guesting on your podcast, uh, having several recordings with you rather than just the one per season. <laughs> It's going to be interesting. It's going to be interesting. That's right. Well, tell everybody about your shows and where they can uh, find them out there on the interwebs. Oh, gosh. Uh, well, uh, I just kind of wrapped up Karate Kid Minutes. Uh, we went through all four of the movies. Uh, there isn't a fifth. Uh, and I've uh, caught up with uh, Cobra Kai as far as it goes. So we're just kind of waiting for the final season of Cobra Kai to come out. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll guess that other movie. I don't know. Um, but uh, <laughs> we also, I also did a Fright Night Minute about the original Fright Night, uh, which rules. And I have folks like, you know, Chris Sarandon and Jonathan Stark guesting on that. I love I love it. It was it was fun. Uh, Superman and Lois TV talk, where I talk with my buddies about the CW show Superman and Lois. And uh, upcoming, I've got a couple of uh, projects in the works. Uh, one's called uh, Sword Boys Cut by Cut, in which uh, me and my uh, fellow <laughs> buddies just talk about sword movies, movie just a movie with a sword uh, in like various pieces at a time not minute by minute we're i'm just kind of i'm almost done with this minute by minute thing i don't know i i, I was bringing it in <laughs> bigger chunks when, I don't we, know. when we hang up minute by minute we go to chunk yeah by yeah, yeah, chunk? yeah yeah cut by cut cut by cut and that's not there all because i'm also uh i also announced recently i i'm going to be covering the uh a robert altman film one that uh uh, is held in uh, really high regard uh, by cinephiles everywhere. That's right. Obviously, I'm talking about Popeye. Uh, I'll be, <laughs> and that is uh, that I just recently named it. It's called Popeye Shanty to Shanty, which is uh, oh. we'll, I'll be covering the chunks of the movie that go right up to the to the song, and then we'll talk about the song. And I don't know. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> love it. Funny. I love it. What a great idea for that movie too. Yeah. Yeah, brilliant. Very, very fun. That's going to be a fun one. So you can find that out there. I don't, I don't know. I have a link tree, but I don't remember the, the thing. But but we'll we'll have the ones that are out there. <laughs> we'll have the links in the show notes, and you can use those and just kind of, you know, whittle your way back to find those other ones. Right. Because, right. Hopefully, so. <laughs> I'm sure that's how the internet works, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> Totally, totally. All right. Well, that's it for today, everybody. Uh, we'll be back tomorrow. We have uh, Justin Yeager uh, from the True Story team joining us to talk about Minute 20. Should be fun. So, Pete, thanks as always. Oh, God. I hope I don't make a mess. <laughs> <laughs> Until next time, true believers.
Marvel Movie Minute is a production of True Story FM, engineering by Andy Nelson. This season's music is Message to the World by Anthony Vega, and this season's show art is by Winston Yabo. Find the show at truestory.fm. If your podcast app allows ratings and reviews, please consider doing that for our show. 